today is our first uh, seminar for a new seminar series that we're having this year um, that um, is going to be USC Upstate and um, USC School of Medicine Greenville. So we're really excited for everybody to be here today to start this new series. And so to start us off, um, we're just going to do a couple of welcome and in, in introduction statements. So I'd like to start by introducing the Dean of the College of Science and Technology um, for USC Upstate, Dr. Jeannie Chapman, um, who is just going to take a minute to welcome you all. So Dr. Chapman. Thank you, Dr. Webb, and good afternoon to all of you who are attending this, which is our, the kickoff of uh, the lecture of our Upstate Research Seminar Series. Um, as Dr. Webb mentioned, this is the beginning of an exciting joint venture between USC Upstate and the USC School of Medicine uh, in Greenville. So let me take a moment to extend my warm greetings to Dean Jenkins and her colleagues and students in Greenville, as well as my uh, thanks to them for partnering with us. I really look forward to the opportunities uh, for learning that this series affords both our students and our faculty. So I'm excited about uh, this venture. Today's seminar, like almost every conversation we seem to be having lately, is going to focus on COVID-19 and the phenomenal vaccines that have been developed to combat it. And while I am very excited to hear from Dr. Kelly again, uh, frankly, I long for the day when COVID no longer dominates the landscape of science and medicine and innovation. And I'm willing to bet that Dr. Kelly wishes the same. Now, don't get me wrong, we'll always have emerging diseases and we'll certainly always have to battle misinformation and science illiteracy. But there are so many areas in science and medicine where we still have so many unanswered questions. And guess where the vast majority of that research takes place? It's on college campuses and in medical schools across the country, around the world for that matter. Sure, there are biotech and pharmaceutical companies, but their focus tends to be on bringing a product to market. They don't have the luxury of wondering about something and then exploring it for the sake of exploring. Nope, that happens here in labs that are run by your professors, where you work alongside your classmates or graduate students or postdocs or physicians to contribute to that great book of knowledge. And my hope is that this seminar series reminds us all how important basic science research is and fuels our collective desire to keep asking questions and pursuing answers to them. Again, thank you all for attending. Thank you to our organizers and Enjoy the seminar. Dr. Webb. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Um, Dr. Feaster is now going to introduce Dr. Jenkins for us. It seems they might be having some technical difficulties. There we go. Jenny, can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. So good afternoon, faculty. Oh, we've, we've lost you, Dr. Feaster. Good afternoon, everyone. As you can tell, we are having some technical difficulties on our side of things, but it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the first of a series of seminars between the faculty at U of SC Upstate and U of SC School of Medicine here in Greenville. Uh, hopefully this will serve as a mechanism for collaboration between our two institutions, as well as a mechanism for interaction between our student bodies. Uh, I would like to start by introducing someone who has been very important and instrumental in developing the research infrastructure here at our institution, Dr. Marjorie Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins has been with us since, when did you start? August 2019. August 2019. Uh, and she joined us from Texas Tech. She is a very well uh, established and investigated researcher. And would you like to say some welcoming words? Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks, Thank Dr. You. Feaster. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to the launch of the Upstate Research Seminar Series. 
It is an honor to welcome you today as the University of South Carolina Upstate and the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Greenville join together to provide a seminar series for the University of South Carolina faculty and students in the Upstate. This seminar series provides the opportunity to continue to build research infrastructure for both of our institutions and provide a foundation for the cultivating of relationships with external partners and networking between our faculty and students. Our institutions are so fortunate to have supporters that made today's event possible. So thank you, Dr. Feaster, Dr. Chozed, and Dr. Webb for organizing today's research seminar. Your commitment to your institutions and your efforts toward prioritizing the importance of research opportunities for our students and faculty is greatly appreciated. Research is invaluable. for developing critical thinking, as well as reminding everyone that the way to improve the health of South Carolina and the world is by asking the right questions and finding the right answers. We welcome you all in celebrating the launch of the Upstate Research Seminar Series and look forward to the endless opportunities ahead of this collaboration. And as the Dean of the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Greenville, I can promise that we will be resourcing collaborative efforts between our institutions in the years to come. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Jenkins. So I have the honor today of introducing our speaker, Dr. Kelly. Dr. So Webb, a little bit about can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So I have the honor today of um, welcoming our speaker, Dr. Kelly. Um, we are honored to have her today. Dr. Kelly is a board certified internist with over 37 years of experience in clinical and public health medicine. Um, she went to med school at the University of Pennsylvania and then did her internship and residency here in South Carolina at MUSC. Um, after working as a primary care physician and 13 years with the Indian Health Service um, with resource limited settings. She then went to the CDC and worked on an epidemic, um, epidemic intelligence service program. After completion of that, she continued working at the CDC with the National Diabetes Education Program and had some other roles in HIV and AIDS research at CDC and the Georgia De Department of Public Health. She currently is our um, assistant state epidemiologist at DHEC and you have probably seen her around over the last 18 months. I've heard her speak before and she does a tremendous job. So I think we are all um, very privileged to hear her today. And so Dr. Kelly, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Now, let me see if I can share my slides. Hang on just a second. Mm. Sorry, every new. Yes, if, so if you click on <laughs> there you go. And then to advance my slides, I just click on them one at a time. Every system is different. Yes, at the bottom, there should be a I little got you. Yes. OK, you can see my slides now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you for, for your patience with me. Okay. This figure shows the epidemic curve of, in South Carolina with SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID-19, the disease it causes. And I've heard people suggest that this summer has been similar to last summer. Oh, didn't we have a surge after 4th of July last year? Yes, but nothing like this. We have not seen this many daily new infections since January of 2021. That red line that I've drawn across trying to show the peak of the curve today versus the peak of the curve back in January when we really had a huge surge. Consistently, the two age groups with the highest number of new cases have been ages 15 through 24 and 25 through 34. And that makes sense to me. I understand that that is often the group that's either in school or in jobs or they are face to face with the community that they have higher exposure risks. But I know that it's more than that. I know that it is also that there are lower levels of immunization. And it's not just about cases, it's about hospitalization and death. And I know in those younger age groups, that's rare. 
but it's not non-existent. The number is not zero. And uh, what is worrisome to me is right now in South Carolina, we have increased number of people being hospitalized, increased number of people in the intensive care unit, increased number of people on ventilators, and we're concerned about staff shortages. You know, our resources, human resources, as well as hospital beds are not infinite. This slide shows uh, the rate of vaccination for different age groups in South Carolina, and the different colors are for different race ethnicity groups. So it's a little bit dated. This was earlier in this month, uh, dated August 7th. And at that time, about 45% of people living in South Carolina, age 12 and above, were fully vaccinated. And that was only about a quarter of kids teenagers age 12 through 19 and only about 23 percent of those age 20 through 24. I'm happy to report that we have had increases in vaccination in both of these groups, substantial increases. I think as part of a back to school realization that vaccination is an important measure because vaccination prevents disease, vaccination prevents people from bringing the virus back home to others who may be immunocompromised or older, then that vaccine also has an impact on quarantine. If you are fully vaccinated and you're a close contact with somebody who has COVID-19, you don't necessarily have to quarantine. If you're asymptomatic, you don't have to quarantine. Nevertheless, we're concerned that there are a great many myths that are circulating that have, are untrue, unfounded, and I have evidence to, just, to bust these myths. I just chose a few of them. There are many more. Some of them are really crazy theories. I want to focus on the ones that don't sound that crazy. And that's the, so insidious because people think, well, wait a minute, maybe that's true. If it's here, I'm reading it in the paper or I'm hearing it from a friend, maybe it's true. I'm going to talk about whether COVID-19 vaccines are experimental. I also want to talk about this concept of vaccines were made too fast to be safe and effective. And the idea that nobody knows how the vaccines work or what's in them. It's a myth that most new infections are among the vaccinated. And it's another myth that vaccination is more dangerous than COVID disease itself. I'm gonna show you some data about this idea that if prior infection, there is still need for vaccine. And I'm gonna give you some evidence to disprove the myth that vaccine affects fertility. Let's go for that. What was that first one again? That first one was Vaccines are experimental and then made too fast to be safe and effective. I'm showing in this slide the three basic phases of vaccine research. The basic science research, the testing for safety and effectiveness in animals, and the clinical trials in humans. Far and away, the longest stage in developing a vaccine or a medication is that basic science research. I mean, we were just talking about basic science research and how important that research is done in, in academic centers and other places around the world. Basic science research, when did that begin for SARS-CoV-2? Well, do you remember, excuse me, I'm gonna, getting ahead of myself. Do you remember SARS-CoV-1? I'm gonna get to that in a minute. This concept, that these vaccines are experimental is not exactly right. The E in EUA means emergency use authorization. I wanna to touch a little bit about what's the difference between an EUA and full FDA approval. In an emergency use authorization, you still need to do all those steps I just mentioned, the basic science research, the animal studies, the phase one, two, three human studies need to gather the same amount of evidence for effectiveness. And then the FDA looks at the considers whether the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks and that there are no other alternatives available, that there's no other vaccine that could work against COVID-19. They base the results on inter they base their decisions on interim results. The big difference between an EUA and the full FDA approval is the number of months of safety follow-up. For an EUA, you have to have a minimum of two months of follow-up of those phase three participants. Now that number is not chosen arbitrarily. 
that they chose two months because most side effects with a vaccine occur in the first six weeks after vaccination. So when Pfizer and Moderna sent in their applications for EUA in December, they each had more than two months worth of safety follow-up of phase three participants. Over the past year, they've been gathering additional information. They continue to follow those phase three participants. It's actually called phase four of the study, that they have to continue to stay in touch with those people looking for safety because a approval or a full biologics license application need not only longer follow-up of those phase three study participants, you also need data on any adverse events that may have occurred with the people who received vaccine under an EUA. So for example, for the Pfizer vaccine, it's received already its full EUA approval. What about Moderna and Janssen or J&J &J vaccine? They're currently still under an EUA. They're gathering that post phase three data. Moderna, I think, and just recently submitted their application for full approval. And I would anticipate that they will receive full approval. They're really a very similar vaccine, really very similar efficacy and safety profile. I imagine that the Janssen or Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, manufacturers will apply soon as well. Now, even though the Pfizer vaccine has full approval, the Moderna and Janssen vaccines, they are not lesser vaccine. It's just that Pfizer started a little earlier, had more data, so they were ready to apply a little bit earlier. In terms of efficacy, I wanna emphasize that the day you get your first dose of vaccine, you are not protected. Full vaccination means two weeks after the second dose for Pfizer and Moderna. And it's been shown to be 95, 96% effective in preventing hospitalization for those two vaccines. The protection is a little bit less, 84 to 85% for the J&J &J vaccine, but that's again against hospitalization and that is highly effective. The effectiveness drops off a little bit for adults over age 75 years, and that's not surprising. A lot of older adults will have a condition called immunosenescence, meaning that as you get over, older, your immune system is not as robust. You don't get as strong an immune response to a vaccine. That's why, for example, we give adults older than 65 a different flu vaccine. You need to give them a stronger stimulus. So the effectiveness of this vaccine for older adults greater than 75 years is a little bit lower, but it's still very high. I mean, it's over 90% for Pfizer and Moderna and 85% for the Janssen vaccine. So again, to emphasize, these vaccines are all safe and effective. Let me back up a little bit though, to talk about how the vaccine works and how we can dispel some of these myths with greater understanding of the biology. Now, I know some of this is going to be very basic for some of you, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page about this. First, terminology. SARS-CoV-2, that's the name of the virus. Coronavirus 19, 2019, or COVID-19, that's the name of the disease that the virus causes. All three of the vaccines I'm going to talk about, and in fact, almost all the vaccines around the world, focus on the spike protein. The spike protein is a protein coat around the, uh, the messenger RNA of the um, virus. Uh, you know, we use DNA, the, this particular virus is an RNA virus. And that spike protein is instrumental in attaching to the cell and fusing with the cell membrane to inject the virus into the cell. And I, I like this simple cartoon. Um, I know this is you know, pretty basic, but it I think goes a long way to explaining how vaccines work. Vaccines provide a sneak preview. You see the wanted poster on the wall showing an image of the virus, and there's the SARS-CoV-2 viruses that have entered the bloodstream, and there are the white blood cells that are looking at them angrily because they recognize them right from the very beginning that these are bad guys. By creating that sneak preview, you can uh, you know, it rev up your immune system to respond more quickly. Now, going back again to these key stages, and I had said basic science research, that's the longest stage. When did we start doing the basic science research for SARS-CoV-2? 
with SARS-CoV-1, the original severe acute respiratory syndrome. This was back in 2003. So basic science research began on the SARS viruses, the fa that family of viruses, over 17 years ago. And during that time, that's when they identified that the spike protein is the place to, uh, to focus if you were going to create a vaccine. That's when they were able to genetically sequence, get the exact genomic sequence of the original SARS virus. So that when SARS-CoV-2 came up, they already knew where they wanted to focus a vaccine. They could compare its genetic, genetic sequence, its genomic sequence with the original virus to know what is different about it and how to make a vaccine that would target it differently. So they were able to very quickly move into those animal studies and move very quickly into those clinical trials. The other thing that was really different about vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines is the, the number of people they recruited for their trials in a short time. The reason that they were able to do those phase three studies so apparently quickly was because they didn't wait normally for financial reasons. Normally a vaccine company would only recruit a few hundred people at a time for their phase three studies. They do it in baby steps because human studies are expensive. They don't want to invest a huge amount of money and then find out that there's a, a safety issue or the vaccine doesn't work as well as they thought. This was different for these vaccines. What was different is that the US government other governments, other intern, other academicians, academic centers, um, other aid, philanthropic agencies, they invested. They said, don't wait, don't take years doing those phase three studies. Go ahead and recruit tens of thousands of people now. And in June and July, I know Pfizer and Moderna, they were able to recruit literally more than 40,000 people during the two month period around the world to be in those phase three studies. That's how they were able to get the vast amount of data that they needed to go for an EUA. Again, this is a very basic schematic, but I, I think it is helpful to understand how vaccine works as we talk about some of these myths. So this is, goes for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. These are mRNA vaccines. They take the messenger RNA, just the gene for the spike protein. So there's no whole virus in these vaccines. There's no weakened or attenuated or killed virus. This is only the gene for the spike protein that is made into a solution, a vaccine. It's injected, cells take up that uh, vaccine, take up the gene for the spike protein, your cells produce some spike proteins and release it into, the, into your system, and your immune system responds by making antibodies, and also, of course, B cell, T cell memory responses as well. Someone asked me, what are the ingredients in these vaccines? So I looked them up, and for example, here are Pfizer's vaccine ingredients. And I thought, let me see if I can simplify this a little bit. I think the important thing to know is that the ingredients in both Pfizer and Moderna, there's an active ingredient of the messenger RNA, but the other ingredients, the inactive ingredients, they are all purposed to protect that messenger RNA so it has a chance to get into the cells. So the, what the, I showed a moment ago may look like a scary, complicated list of chemicals, but what it really boils down to are four lipids, four fats or oils, including polyethylene glycol, which is a common ingredient in a lot of over-the-counter laxatives. It's in colase, for example. And that's the ingredient that some people may be allergic to. But otherwise, it, there are a couple of salts, there's sucrose, very simple basic ingredients. There are no antibiotics, preservatives, mercury, aluminum, there's no gluten, there's no egg. You know, they, they have made these vaccines deliberately very simple to try and avoid allergic reactions. Similarly, for the Janssen vaccine, so this was for Pfizer and Moderna, for the Janssen vaccine, it works a little bit differently. Instead of uh, using just messenger RNA, they created what, what I think of as like a Trojan horse or like a delivery truck. They take an adenovirus, 
you know, a common cold virus and they weaken it. So you've got an adenovirus vector as their delivery truck because their common cold viruses are very good at getting into the cell. And they carry the spike protein um, genetic code, but in this case, they use DNA instead of RNA. DNA is less fragile than RNA, so you don't need to keep it super frozen. It can be just refrigerated. It can be stable for months in the back of the refrigerator. The other nice thing about the Janssen vaccine is that at least the way we are currently using it, it is just a single dose. And most people have only mild symptoms after they're vaccinated. It got its emergency use authorization from the FDA back in February. Common ingredients in the Janssen vaccine. Again, it looks it's a very similar slide, isn't it? Because the ingredients are very similar. You get the gene for the spike protein. You've got lipids, salts, sugars. But this time, instead of the polyethylene glycol, it's got something called polysorbate 80. I mention that because, again, there are some people who are allergic to polysorbate 80, even though it's a common ingredient in many foodstuffs, in ice cream, in salad dressing, for example. In terms of efficacy, Janssen vaccine is 85 protective against severe disease two weeks after one shot. That's after only one shot. It may be, you know, they're doing research now to decide is one shot enough or should we get a booster dose with the Janssen vaccine? And at the end of this presentation, I am going to talk a bit about boosters. What about the mythology that there are, that more people who are vaccinated are getting infected than people who are unvaccinated? That's absolutely not true. Now, I've borrowed this slide, in fact, from the U of SC College of Pharmacy, um, where they have taken some of our DHEC data and put it in a really nice visual format here. In the month of July, while the Delta variant has been circulating, we've had a little more than 14,000 reported cases. 88% of those cases were among people who were not fully vaccinated. We had 550 hospitalization. 77% of those people who were hospitalized were not fully vaccinated. And we had 110 deaths. 79% of them were not fully vaccinated. Now, what about those people who, let's turn that question around. What about the people who were fully vaccinated who still got infected in the hospital or who died? That's a worrisome thing, right? Well, a couple of points to make. One is, the average age of the fully vaccinated cases who were hospitalized was 72. And the average age for the fully vaccinated people who died was 80. There were older adults who had multiple medical problems. And as I'd mentioned earlier, often vaccines don't have the same rigorous, robust response in older individuals. Their immune systems are not as strong as younger individuals. But there's another important point and that is look at those breakthrough cases as a percent of the people vaccinated. We've had over 2 million people vaccinated in South Carolina. We have had a total number of breakthrough hospitalizations or deaths of 406. So 406 people who were fully vaccinated in South Carolina have been hospitalized or died but that's a percentage of those who were fully vaccinated that is really quite small. It is 0.02%. And if we look at the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths, you know, again, it is quite small. The number of breakthrough deaths, while tragic, 77 out of over 2 million people vaccinated. Vaccines are highly efficacious in preventing disease, keeping you out of the hospital, keeping you out of the morgue. I want to show this slide from the medical university because this was a slide that took um, that looked at data in uh, earlier in the year to determine the number of people who were um, having breakthrough cases who were not vaccinated or who didn't have a prior infection. So they were also looking at, well, does prior infection work? Again, the vast majority of infections were among those people who had not been vaccinated or who had never been infected before. 
Now this is interesting because you can see that there's a little square of the number of people who had prior infection, that there were only a small number of them who had a repeat infection. But they have a caveat there in red that it may immunity from prior infection may not work well against variants. This study was on data from May that ended, the data collection ended in May. That's before the Delta variant really started circulating. And I'll show you some data of concern. The Delta variant is a game changer. What about this myth that vaccination is more dangerous than COVID-19? In this country, we have had over 600,000 COVID deaths. That's 1.7% of those who tested positive. Yes, they were higher date rates of death among people with, who were older, who, who had chronic medical conditions, but we have had pediatric deaths. We have had people who were young adults, no medical problems who have died. In contrast, over 350 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been given in the U.S. since December 14, 2020. We have had a few severe allergic reactions, one to five severe allergic reactions per million doses. That's about on par with what we see with influenza. We have not had anyone die from an allergic reaction. There were 28 cases of a rare blood, rare disorder with blood clots and low platelet count, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome or TTS associated with the Janssen vaccine. Three people died, but that again is out of how many millions of people who were vaccinated. Now you may have been reading more about myocarditis and Pfizer vaccine, and this is a little bit more complicated because the myocarditis and inflammation of the heart muscle varies depending upon gender. Males are more susceptible than females, and it varies a lot by age where with younger adults being more vulnerable. But let's, let's look at this data a little bit more closely, and let's try and put it in a context that, that we can visualize. So for example, for uh, imagine a stadium, 80,000 boys, all age 12 through 17, who are all vaccinated. About five to six of them will experience myocarditis on average. And almost all cases thus far have been mild and have completely resolved. Now let's imagine another stadium. 80,000 boys aged 12 through 17 who are not vaccinated. Most of them will do fine, but on average, based on data through May 2021, 456 would get COVID, 18 would be hospitalized, five in the ICU, and there would be 0.2 deaths over the next three months. Now, I know that's a small number, but remember there were zero deaths with myocarditis. And this data is based on uh, data before Delta was widespread. So again, we're going to need to return to think more carefully about what it means when Delta is the predominant variant. Do you need COVID-19 vaccine if you've already had COVID? That's another one of the myths. If you had prior infection, do you, is it, do you not need vaccine? Well, here's a study that was published very recently, August, 2021, and was done in Kentucky, comparing residents who had been infected with SARS-CoV-2 last year, in May and June, 2020, a year earlier. And then they looked at who got reinfected by May to June, 2021, compared to those who didn't get reinfected. And they found that people who had been infected before, but got vaccinated, had a much lower rate than those who did not get vaccinated. In fact, unvaccinated people with prior infection were more than twice as likely to get reinfected than vaccinated. So yes, prior infection gives you some immunity, but not as much as vaccination. It improves the protection for people previously infected. This study was done before the Delta variant was around. Infection with a different variant might not protect you as well against Delta but vaccine will. How can I say that? Well, let me share just one graph from this study published in Nature. This is looking at variant sensitivity to neutralizing antibodies. So on the graph on the left, where it says M12 pause, that means somebody who, what, this, these are a group of individuals who had been infected, they were had a positive test 12 months earlier. They took 
convalescent serum from those individuals and they, in a test tube, tested them for neutralizing antibody protection with four different variants. The D614G, that's the original Wuhan wild type variant. Alpha is the variant that came from, that was first identified in England. Beta is the variant that was first identified in South Africa. And Delta is the one that is circulating now. More than 95% of the country, new cases are from the Delta variant. So you can see on that graph for the M12 pause, the circles represent levels of neutralizing antibodies. And they vary from person to person. But the black horizontal bars show you the median, the mean, show you the average response to of neutralizing antibodies. It's lower for uh, the wild type and alpha, alpha than you'd like, but it's at least some protection. But for beta and delta, it is below that dotted line, which is the level of neutralizing and minimum level of neutralizing antibody that you would like to see. Now let's compare it to the graph on the right. This is, again, people who were, had a positive test 12 months earlier, but who have been since vaccinated. There's an increase in their neutralizing antibodies to all of the variants, but there's also a robust response to beta and delta variants. So at this point in time, vaccine works against delta variant. Prior infection does not provide adequate protection. What about COVID vaccine and fertility? Well, of course, in the phase three studies, pregnant women were excluded. Nobody was going to recruit a pregnant woman to be participating in a study on a vaccine. As it turns out, in Pfizer vaccine studies, 23 of the women volunteers became pregnant after receiving the vaccine, but the only one who suffered a pregnancy loss was someone in the placebo group. We think that we thought at this time that there should be no danger of these vaccines in pregnancy, but we didn't have the data that we have at this point. You know, we give vaccines to pregnant women or women who are trying to get pregnant all the time. You know, uh, uh, tetanus shots, flu shots, we give these vaccines to pregnant women. The only vaccine you want to avoid during pregnancy is a live virus vaccine, like a yellow fever vaccine. So in the beginning, all we could say was that we don't think that there's an impact. We don't think that there are going to be side effects. We, and we know that there'll be a transfer of antibodies to unborn child, just like there are with other vaccines. But we know a lot more today. I had to go back first, though, to figure out where did this fertility rumor begin? And I think this is a curious uh, way to understand how rumors spread. In December 2020, that's when Pfizer and Moderna were applying for an EUA here in the United States, they were doing the same thing in Europe. And a physician politician and an ex-Pfizer employee wrote a letter to the European equivalent of the FDA. And they claimed that the spike protein was so similar in structure to a placenta protein that the vaccine would cause a woman to make antibodies to the placenta and have miscarriages and that that would affect their fertility. Well, there's no evidence that that is true. And in fact, there is strong evidence to counter this concept. If the COVID vaccine affected the placenta, you would expect more miscarriages. This table is taken out of a study that was published in June in the New England Journal of Medicine. And on the left-hand side, the first column lists some various outcomes around pregnancy. And the term spontaneous abortion, that's the medical term for a miscarriage. So miscarriage less than 20 weeks, stillbirth is a loss of a baby after more than 20 weeks gestation. What they did was they examined data from over 35,000 pregnant women who were vaccinated either during pregnancy or shortly before. The middle column here where it says published incidents, that's the background rate. We have information in the United States on the background rate in general on pregnancies for different complications. Miscarriage varies high, widely depending upon your access to health care, other medical conditions, but it has a rate of unfortunately about 10 to 26 percent of pregnancies end in a miscarriage. For those 35,000 women who enrolled in a registry called VSAFE, where the pregnancy outcomes were reported to the CDC, 
there was a, a miscarriage rate of 12.6%, so about the same as the background rate. And there's some additional data. There was another publish, uh, publication recently, which also was seeing no increase in miscarriage. What they did was to took, take the many years of data that we have on miscarriages and to look at it more closely by mother's age, by what week of pregnancy she miscarried, because maybe, maybe there's something else more subtle going on. And they, again, looked at the background rate of not just in the United States, but in other high-income countries. What proportion of pregnancies, early pregnancies, you know, first um, trimester and the beginning of second trimester and in miscarriage. And they found 11 to 16%. Among the over 2,000 pregnant women who received either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine before conceiving or before 20 weeks of pregnancy, the risk of marriage, uh, miscarriage again was 12.8%. There's no evidence that these vaccines can affect fertility. There is, unfortunately, a lot of evidence that, that COVID-19 disease during pregnancy causes severe disease, much higher rates of hospitalization, higher rates of miscarriage from COVID-19 disease, higher rates of the mom ending up in the intensive care unit, the infant ending up in the neonatal intensive care unit. It is really tragic that women trying to get pregnant or women who are pregnant are afraid to get vaccinated because there's no threat to the pregnancy and there's tremendous benefit to the mother and unborn child. There's also a syndrome called long COVID. You know, if the, what I have heard from individuals who are who have not been vaccinated is they've chosen not to get vaccine because they feel they're young and strong and healthy and they don't need a vaccine because if they get COVID, they won't get seriously ill. But they might be right that statistically their chance of getting severe COVID is low. Unfortunately, we are gathering more and more information about something called long COVID, and it's being found even in children, that they'll have long lasting symptoms, even among people who only had mild disease, that they'll continue to have that brain fog, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, just you know, um, deconditioning that can last for months. So I, I'm again encouraging people to consider the risk benefit analysis for each of us as an individual. You know, what are the risks of vaccines? Not very many risks to taking a, this vaccine. What are the benefits? Well, the, you have to think about the risk of if you got COVID-19, what could happen to you? What's your personal risk? Let me finish by focusing on this idea of a third shot or a booster shot. So right now, the FDA has, a, has given an emergency use for people who are immunocompromised. And so individuals who are immunocompromised are those who have medical conditions like having a tumor, a cancer, or they've had a, a transplant. People who have a medical condition that means that they're on medication that immu causes immunocompromise. Those are individuals for whom FDA is recommending a third shot. But the reason they're recommending it is because they're concerned that the first two shots didn't give them as robust a re immune response. So they're recommending you need to get this vaccine as a third shot as soon as possible. That's a little different from booster shots. So additional dose for people who are immunocompromised because they didn't have a strong response to the original series. A booster dose would be something that would boost immunity for people who had a response, but for whom now the immunity is kind of waning. You know, when we first decided the recommendations about how to space out the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, that's a minimum time frame. You know, there's some evidence that we could have stretched that out even longer, delayed the second dose, but that would have left a lot of people at risk, so we didn't do that. I don't want people to think that needing a booster shot means that the vaccines don't work. Many vaccines require boosters. All those pediatric vaccines where you have to give three, four, even five doses to you know, really stimulate their immune system. And it's not just kids, that's true for adults as well. The hepatitis B vaccine is a series of three. So boosters are common in vaccinology. This is not a sign that vaccine doesn't work. Now, where did these recommendations come from around a booster dose? Well, of course, 
Booster doses are not approved for the general public yet because they're examining the data. We know that there has been strong vaccine effectiveness consistently for six months. And I'm just showing you an example here. This is for overall, for most people, the bar is all the way on the left. They've got excellent vaccine effectiveness. And it doesn't, you know, between two and 12 weeks after vaccination. And it only dropped a tiny amount for going out to 24 weeks. It's a little different with older adults, dropped a little bit more. There you can see the third set of bars, the immunocompromised, it drops even more. That's why we're encouraging a third dose or people with multiple morbidities, meaning other medical problems. But the recent discussion around booster doses comes from the next two studies that I'm going to show you. One was a study among nursing home residents. Nursing home residents usually are not only older, they're more feeble. There's a reason why they're in a nursing home. They've either got multiple medical problems or behavioral problems. Well, vaccine was working really well for nursing home residents. It was 95% effective against infection among nursing home residents earlier in the vaccination program, March through May. But it really started to drop off in June and July 2021 when the Delta variant was the predominant variant. The effectiveness in preventing infection among nursing home residents dropped to 53%. Now, this was about eight months after they got their first doses. Because remember, nursing home residents in South Carolina, they were the, you know, among the first to be vaccinated. So there was some concern about, is this waning immunity? Is that because it's now they're at the six to eight month point or is it the Delta variant? Similarly, there was a study in New York State. This wasn't looking at just nursing home residents. This was looking at everybody. And they did an age adjustment to try and tease out whether is this because they're old or is this other factors? And they found also from you know, during May through July, the overall vaccine effectiveness in keeping you out of the hospital in New York was pretty stable, above 90%, 90, 92, 95%. But then it started to drop and it dropped from 92% to 80% at the same time that the Delta variant increased from 2% to over 80% in the United States. So there are a lot of questions here. Is, did this happen because you have an increased viral load with Delta? Is it because there's waning immunity? Is it because there's an escape mutation that escapes the neutralizing antibodies? Or is what about the role of changes in behavior? You know, New York was opening up. People weren't wearing masks. They were gathering indoors. They weren't distancing. So that raises the question of a booster dose. But I want to say it's not a done deal. I know we have all seen the headlines. You know, we're prepared to offer booster shots for all Americans beginning the week of September 20th and starting eight months after an individual's second dose yet. But I just want to say that FDA and ACIP are review reviewing the data right now. You know, who got vaccinated eight months ago? People who were at high risk, healthcare workers who are exposed more frequently, people in long-term care facilities, nursing homes, you know, the older adults. It might be that they need a booster shot. Maybe everybody else does not need a booster shot. We don't know yet. That's what we're waiting to hear from FDA and from ACIP. I think the big, I have three take-home messages one is that the Delta variant spreads more easily. That's what it does. It's not that it is more serious necessarily or causes more severe disease, but definitely spreads more easily and that vaccines currently still work against the Delta variant. I am a little bit concerned that if people don't get vaccinated, if we can't get more of the population vaccinated, we may have yet another variant emerge that vaccine will not work against and will be you know, kind of back to the drawing board with getting mm -hmm. on, on tweaking the vaccine to um, protect against an emerging variant. And lastly, each of us has to make our own personal decision weighing benefits and risks. You know, the, we know the benefits of the vaccines. They're highly effective and very safe. In terms of risk, I think you have to weigh it against your personal risk. What's your risk of being infected, getting COVID-19 disease? 
What's your personal risk of having severe disease or long-term effects? What's your personal risk of bringing it home to someone else who might not be vaccinated because it's a child under age 12 or somebody who couldn't be vaccinated for some other reason? My last slide, I'm including my email address, kellyjm1 at dhec.sc.gov, because if there are questions that we don't answer today or things that you think of later, please do email me. If you have a question, probably somebody else does as well, and I'd like to be able to offer that information. And I learn. I learn from your questions. I learn what's important to people, what they need to know. So thank you very much, and I'll see if I can figure out how to unshare my slides take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. That was wonderful. Um, we are open for questions. So if anybody has any questions, you can either uh, raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. Dr. Kelly will answer those. And while we're waiting for some, I'll start off with a question, Dr. Kelly. Um, I'm curious about the early on you provided, I think maybe USC's pharmacy school had made a figure of the deaths and hospitalizations in vaccinated. So my question is the deaths the deaths in the vaccinated, I want to say it was 77, but I could be wrong on that. Is there data showing how many of those due to COVID? Because I know a lot of that is people who got tested just because they were being admitted to the hospital for something else. So how many of those were due to COVID? So specifically the ones I showed did die from complications of COVID. You are correct that sometimes the data is depicted a different way. For example, on the CDC website, they will also include people who were vaccinated, who were being admitted for something completely different. Maybe they're being admitted for gallbladder surgery or because they broke a hip and they do a swab just routinely. Anytime somebody is being routine admitted to the hospital, they may have no COVID symptoms at all but they were asymptomatic, positive test. It's a breakthrough case, but no symptoms, but they're in the hospital for something else. That's not how we did it. We're, with the data I'm presenting to you today around hospitalization in South Carolina, those were all people who were hospitalized for COVID indication. And among those who died, they, uh, they died with complications of COVID. And I'm just looking, I do have the numbers in front of me. So for the month of July, I have that there were um, 23 people who died related to COVID, but that's where the average age was 80 years, the age range was 60 to 100 years, and 100% and of them had other medical conditions like diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, the complicated things. I don't know that for the total number, that 77 is like for the total number since we started vaccinating that there have been 77 deaths uh, that have occurred despite the fact that they were fully vaccinated, but many of those were nursing home residents. Thank you, that answered my question. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, Leslie, do you have a question? Leslie, Leslie you if you're asking, yeah. I can't hear you. Yes, unmute yourself. Nope, the hand might have been. And, and if we can't hear you, I imagine you could put it in the chat box. Yes, and that might have been a hand by accident because I think that's been happening too. Um, Lo, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Hmm. Um, if you could put, if you're trying to ask a question, if you could just put it in the chat, it may be based on the number of attendees that it is not allowing us to unmute. Um, so please put your questions in the chat. And Dr. Kelly, while we wait, I'll ask another question. Um, I'm curious, the clotting disorder that we saw with Johnson Johnson, what what difference, the number of patients who had that compared to the typical rate of that disorder that you see in the general population, was it significantly higher than what we would otherwise expect? That's a very rare um, phenomenon. This uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia is, is very rare. It is usually associated with heparin uh, use. So the anticoagulant heparin sometimes has this really bizarre side, you know, side
Dr. Kelly, I think you might have become muted while you were talking. I, think I did. Just, there it goes. I did. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't, didn't think I had touched anything. Just to repeat, in terms of safety, zero deaths from myocarditis, zero deaths from anaphylaxis, three deaths from that thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, but that's a, a very rare condition. Thank you. Um, and the chat is now available. It was um, turned off, but it is turned back on. So um, you can put your questions in there now. Yes, the mics are not available because of the number of participants, but you can, the chat is open. So please put your questions in the chat. And I will put my email address in the chat as well, so you'll have it there. If, if anybody wants to email me later, you can. I don't know if anybody's interested in monoclonal antibodies, but I'll say a little bit about that while we're waiting for questions via the chat. There are certain treatments that you can get for um, COVID-19 disease, if you get infected and you're not in severely ill, you're like in the first five to 10 days of illness, but you have some other medical condition that worries you. For example, you have type one diabetes or again, older adults, but people who have chronic medical problems, they can receive a medication called monoclonal antibodies or passive antibodies. And that's true whether you've been vaccinated or not. It's like an antibody boost, but you can't wait. It has to be given early for it to be effective. If somebody waits until they are in the hospital or severely ill, it is too late. Those monoclonal antibodies won't work. Uh, I see some questions. So I'm going to see if we can go through this. Um, how can one make the best choice for themselves with vaccine mandates on the rise and jobs being leveraged over individuals? I, you know, I think that that is a, that's a tough question. I know workers in healthcare settings, many healthcare settings are requiring COVID-19 vaccination because they deal with vulnerable people and they don't want the spread of disease and they don't want their employees out. I'm sure that's true for lots of other industries. That's not a, a new phenomenon though. Many healthcare facilities require employees, for example, to get the flu shot. So, you know, this is the Pfizer vaccine is a fully approved vaccine. Um, I do anticipate that more and more employers are going to mandate it. You always have the option of working someplace else. And I, I know that that's a harsh thing to say, but I know that that is a, a, a challenge for many people. Um, and I would say that making the best choice for oneself is to get as much information as you can and get your information from credible sources, social media, news media, often not the best source. I would go, if you don't like go, using government websites, CDC, DHEX website, go to Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Public Health. They have an excellent website on COVID-19 with a lot of information. Can children who get COVID receive the monoclonal antibodies? You have to be at least age 12 and at least, I think it's 80 pounds. Um, what do I see as the future of COVID and the variants? Well, I don't think that we're going to eliminate COVID the way we have eliminated polio in this country. I don't think we're going to eradicate it the way we've eradicated smallpox in the world. I think it is going to become endemic and make the rounds. However, I think we can get it out of this crisis situation. We get enough people vaccinated that it will turn into an annoying condition rather than one that is a devastating condition. You know, because you may have breakthrough cases, but the most, far and away, the majority of breakthrough cases are mild. It's like having a cold. So vaccine will still protect you against uh, hospitalization and death. So I, I do, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't say for sure. I do have a feeling though that COVID is going to stay around uh, and, you know, viruses mutate. So we'll see some other variants. Um, the concern is that will we see a variant that starts to e evade the vaccine? We hope not. Um, that's why it's important that we get as many people vaccinated as we can now so that we can suppress the virus so it can't mutate as much. 
I see a question. I am not immunocompromised, but I'm thinking about getting the third shot for me and the family. What do you think? I think I want to wait to see what FDA and ACIP say, because they're going to make recommendations for when you should get that third dose. For the people who are immunocompromised, you want to get it as soon as possible because the first two didn't take as well as you would like. For everybody else, if you want to get a booster, I would wait to see what ACIP and FDA says. Is it best to get it six months after the second shot? Is it best to get it eight months? What if you got the Janssen vaccine? Should you get an additional dose of Janssen? They're going to look at the data. We have information on that. There have been studies going on about that. So I would rather wait and see what they say the answers are. So, you know, I think getting a, a, a third shot is uh, is going to be the reality available to most of us, but I'd like to hear the details behind the scene before I make a decision. What do I know about the Lambda variant? The Lambda variant, new variant circulating in South America. Right now, CDC considers it a variant of interest, meaning that the uh, it is a variant we need to keep our eye on. The Delta variant and some of the other variants were variants of concern because there was good evidence that they spread more quickly or that they caused more severe disease. The Lambda variant, we don't have good evidence yet that it spreads more quickly. That might still come, but right now it's uh, you know fewer than 1% of new cases in the United States. So right now CDC is just keeping an eye on it. Same thing for us. The, you know, Right now we don't see the Lambda variant taking over from the Delta variant, but you know, there have been so many twists and turns in this um, in this past year that might yet come. Here's a question. I am on chemo. My oncologist does not want to draw antibody levels on me because we do not know what level is protective. Is that being researched? Are levels known? So here's the deal. Antibodies are not the only thing in your immune system, right? We all know this, that there are T cells, B cells, memory cells, lots of other things. We do not know what level of antibodies are um, going to be protective. We don't know the term is correlates of protection. We don't know the exact correlate of protection. And it can be misleading. What if you draw antibodies and you're misled? You think, oh, they're, they're high enough, they're good enough. Or they may be antibodies that neutralized the old variant, you know, the one that you had been infected with before, but they won't neutralize the Delta. So we'd rather play it safe and not rely on measuring antibody levels. Certainly they measure antibody levels in studies. They're doing research studies to look at neutralizing antibodies and give those answers. But on a routine, for someone who is on chemo, somebody who's immunocompromised, we would recommend just go ahead and get that third dose of vaccine. Is the vaccine going to be something like the flu vaccine where it'll be suggested yearly? See, it doesn't seem like this virus will go anywhere. Well, it it may become like the flu vaccine. Um, the, the reason we need a new flu vaccine is that the flu virus frequently mutates. And they, you know, and they name those flu viruses by the hemagglutinin and uh, hyaluronidase that's on its surface. That's why you'll hear an H1N1, you know, it's referring to all the different components, the protein components on the surface of influenza. We need a new flu vaccine every year because that H and that N changes year to year. Will that happen with the COVID vaccine? Will that happen with SARS-CoV-2? Uh, no one knows for sure yet. Maybe not. It may be that one variant will become predominant or that a group of variants will become predominant. As long as the vaccine keeps you out of the hospital and out of the morgue, we might not need additional boosters. Now I phrase it that way because this is anthropomorphic, but if you kind of put yourself in the position of the virus, the virus doesn't necessarily want to kill you. What it wants to do is spread more easily from one person to another. So it makes sense to me that Delta has mutated into a virus that spreads more easily. But if we can vaccinate enough people, we might not need boosters every single year because the, the virus might not have the drive to mutate like that. If all it wants to do is continue to spread like a common cold, it's possible that it would turn into that. We're not there yet. It may be that we'll need a booster like tetanus to get a booster every 10 years. We don't know as yet. 
If you had a bad experience with COVID itself, would the same thing happen if you get the vaccine? No, not necessarily. I know there's a lot of focus on the symptoms people experience after getting vaccinated. Some people don't seem to have much in the way of symptoms at all. Others seem to have pretty substantial symptoms. I know I got vaccinated and the next day I had a sore arm, otherwise it was no big deal. I have friends who said, oh no, I, I stayed home from work. I just spent the day lying on the couch. So it does seem to vary, but it doesn't have to, it's not the same thing as what you might have experienced with COVID disease itself. You will not necessarily have as severe a reaction with the vaccine. Um, my connection was bad when I started talking about some of the myths. Will you hit the point, main points again? And But I think that this recording will be available. Uh, let me take another question and then I'll come back and I'll reiterate those main points. Um, are we able to tell if the Delta variant is more dangerous for kids or are the increases in pediatric cases simply due to increased cases overall? That's still not certain. I know some, there have been some headlines suggesting that Delta is more dangerous, but think of it this way. If you had 10 times more people who got infected, you might have 10 times more people in the hospital or 10 times more people with severe disease. So it, it may be simply that we're having more kids in the hospital because there's more disease circulating. It's also important for folks to know that, you know, our hospitals are, many of them are near capacity, including the pediatric hospitals, but it's not all COVID. There's also RSV, respiratory syncytial virus circulating. We don't usually see that this time of year, but last year during the winter when so many kids were masking, it actually protected them against RSV. We didn't see a lot of flu or RSV last year because of all those protective measures. We're starting to see those cases now because they didn't get their masks are off. So we're starting to see RSV. So it, I'm not certain that the Delta variant is more dangerous. We just may be seeing more uh, hospitalizations because of more cases. Do we know why people react differently to the vaccine? My sister had no trouble my brother had the hardest time and now he's nervous about the second shot. So I, it, it really varies a lot. And part of it is immune response. People who have a really strong immune response feel it more. They feel the inflammation. They feel their whole immune system revving up with cytokines and different inflammatory markers. So in a way, it's a good sign if you have a substantial response. It means that vaccine is working. It's interesting that people over age 65 tend to have fewer symptoms from the vaccine than younger adults. Younger adults seem to have more symptoms. And I think that reflects the, you know, how strong their immune systems are. There's no good way to tell ahead of time if you're gonna be that person who has a strong response. What, I, what you can do though, though, is if the day after you're getting vaccine or you know 12 hours after you get vaccinated, you're starting to feel bad, take something for it. Take some Tylenol for it. Um, take care of yourself. Go to bed. Schedule your vaccine when you've got the next day off. A lot of employers are giving people time, you know, time out, off that does not come out of their sick leave in order to recover, either to get vaccinated or to recover from being vaccinated. I'm going to go back to the main talking points of the myths. The main talking points of the myths are vaccine was not developed too quickly to be safe and effective. We've got basic science data, it goes back 17 years. When SARS-CoV-2 turned up on the scene, we already had all that homework because they were already working on a vaccine for the original SARS and for MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which some people may have heard of, um, another related virus. So it was, it was not too fast to get this through. Pfizer has gotten full approval. The difference between full approval and EUA is just the amount of, of time that you spend doing follow-up safety studies. Moderna is ready to submit for their approval as well. Janssen is only a couple of months away. Uh, the other myths that we talk about is are, are most of the cases among the vaccinated? No, no, no. Far and away, most of the cases are among people who are not vaccinated. What about prior infection? Prior infection protects you some, but it is not as strong a protection as vaccination. Even if you had prior infection and then get vaccinated, that vaccine has extra value. And that was shown in a study in Kentucky where the people who had prior infection but no vaccine, 
two and a half times higher rate of reinfection versus those who got vaccinated. What about fertility? There's no evidence that vaccine interferes with fertility. There have been studies over, involving over 35,000 women who got vaccinated either while pregnant or shortly before pre getting pregnant. No increase in miscarriages, no increase in out, the adverse outcomes. On the other hand, pregnancy and COVID-19 disease are a bad combination. Pregnant women who get COVID are far more likely to end up in the hospital with serious complications than and pregnancy loss. I'm just scrolling down to see if there's anything else. Do I think there'll be another SARS that will become pre prevalent in the US? You know, maybe another SARS, but there's always gonna be, unfortunately, another emerging infectious disease. You know, uh, since, in the, since I went to medical school, we've had if things, I tell you true, before I, when I was in medical school, there was no HIV. There was no name for chlamydia. There was no name for uh, hepatitis C. Those viruses were around, but we didn't have them isolated. We didn't even have names for them. Since then, my goodness, we've had Zika em emerge. We've had uh, 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 chicken, uh, I'm blocking on the names of some of the other viruses, but we had a number of other viruses. Chikungunya, that's where I was going for. Chikungunya emerge, Nipah emerge, a number of other viruses. There will always be new emerging viruses. What we need to do is strengthen our public health structure so that we respond quickly and appropriately. Do I think CDC will implement a mask mandate again? They are recommending that everybody mask but they don't have the legal authority. That's on more of a state level. Certainly there can be a federal mandate that comes out of the White House, but I don't think that that will come. But then again, I don't, again, I don't have a crystal ball and don't know if this surge gets much worse, things may change yet again. What would I say to someone who's waiting to see if the vaccines are safe in the long term? Well, I can certainly understand back in December, January, when the vaccines were first coming out, I could certainly understand people saying, I don't know, I don't want to be first in line, I'm going to wait and see. But at this point, with over 350 million doses of vaccine given out, and people who started those phase three studies back in June, July, we have more than a year of data on them. What is it that you're waiting to see? I mean, if you look at other vaccines, right? We've got dozens of other vaccines. What have we learned from those other vaccines? We have learned that you don't have long-term side effects that show up years down the line. If you're going to have a reaction, say, Guillain-Barre syndrome, you know, some, there are some rare reactions to vaccines. They happen in the first six weeks. They don't happen years later. Uh, my concern is cold season is coming. Schools are open with no masks. Kids are not able to vaccinate yet. Yes, I'm worried about that as well. Uh, kids age 12 and older can vaccinate. So if you have a child under age 12, try to get people vaccinated around that child. That child, if they've you've got older kids in the family they, and your older kids have friends uh, and the friends want to come over, you might want to institute uh, a rule in the household that can't have older friends, can't have friends visiting who are not vaccinated, at least not in the house with those younger children. And I'll tell you, I know a number of physician colleagues who have enrolled their children under age 12 in, um, in vaccine studies because they're doing vaccine studies in kids under age 12. And I mention that because that just shows the high level of confidence most, admittedly not all, but most physicians in this country have in these vaccines that they're so anxious to get their children vaccinated that they'll enroll them in these studies because they, they know that these vaccines are safe and effective. The studies in the kids under age 12 are more to figure out what's the right dose. You know, do you go by the weight of the child? You don't give them the same dose that you gave the adults. Do you go by the weight? Do you go by the age? You know, that sort of question. Do they need a booster timing, a different timing than as adults? I'm not seeing any more questions. Sorry if I've missed any. I'm just scrolling through to see. I don't think you have. Um, I have a question. 
And I'm curious what you would, how you would respond to people and explain kind of public health principles to a lot of people who say they won't get the vaccine because there is a 99% survival rate, so why would they receive a vaccine? How would you respond to those individuals? Let's think about those numbers. How many people have died in the United States associated with COVID? Over 600,000. So if 99% of them survive, then 600,000 is only 1% of what? 600,000 or less than 1%. 600,000 would be 1% of 6 million. Am I doing that arithmetic right? No, it would be 60 million, right? 600,000 is 1% of 60 million. Do we think 60 million people in the United States have had COVID? The official records say about 34 million. Maybe some of those cases never got tested, never got diagnosed. But, you know, I've also heard people say 99.7% of people survivability. But that would mean over 200 million people had COVID-19 in the United States. And I don't think that's true. So number one, I think there's something funny about that arithmetic. I don't think that's, you know, 99% survival. I, I don't think that because we've had 600,000 people die. And the other way to flip it around is to say, well, how many of those deaths, were those deaths just among old people who would have died anyway? Well, no, we can look at how many of those deaths are um, excess deaths. And the way you do that is you look at, on average, how many people die per year of all causes? How many people die per year? And how many excess deaths did we have this year? It's estimated at over 200,000. So over 200,000 people died this year of COVID, of other things that wouldn't have died otherwise. If, if you you know compare it to previous years, so I my answer to that why get vaccinated when 99% of people survive? Number one, I don't believe that number. Number two, let's let's just say it's two percent uh, that die. Still a small number. That's two percent who didn't have to die. These vaccines are highly efficacious. How do you know you're not in that two percent? Oh, because you're young and strong and healthy. Okay. It's still not zero. The risk with receiving the vaccine, the risk of death, is pretty darn close to zero. There have been three deaths associated with vaccine, and those were those weird blood clot disorders. You know, some, sometimes very rare things are going to happen. Your chance of dying from the vaccine is vanishingly smaller than your chance of having severe illness and dying of COVID-19. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions while we still have Dr. Kelly's time? I don't see any other questions. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful talk, very informative, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to come today. Glad to do it. Thanks for everyone for sticking through to the end. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.